Hello, statistics students. In our last video, we learned how to construct a confidence interval for a population mean based on just drawing a sample and getting that sample mean. But we had the unrealistic um, requirement that we somehow magically knew the population sigma. Well, if you don't know the mean, but you somehow magically know the population sigma, well, life is good. You can use the normal curve table and you know, use that to get your Z critical value in order to do your margin of error in your confidence interval. But what if you don't, you want to know the population mean and you don't know sigma? Well, what we're going to do is we're gonna take a sample of size little n, we're gonna calculate the mean and the standard deev for that sample. And from that information, we're going to estimate mu. What that will do, however, is it will require us to learn how to do a new type of table, which is the t-table showing the t-distribution. <laughs> so let's take a look in our current book on page 310. And I encourage you to take out your book and follow along. I don't know how great you're going to be able to see this on video. Now you see that the T distribution, or the sorry, the T statistic looks much like the formula for the um, Z statistic. The only difference is S over root N in, in the denominator instead of sigma over root n. Um, so essentially, I'm going to um, shortcut this. I encourage you to read this on page 310. But the bottom line is, there are an infinite number of t-curves. There is a different t-curve for each df, or degrees of freedom. We're going to talk about degrees of freedom in a moment. For right now, um, for our purposes, degrees of freedom is just your sample size minus one. And I'll show you why that is. The symbol we often see for degrees of freedom, I just prefer to use DF, because it makes sense to me. But if we have to use a Greek letter, we're gonna use the Greek letter lowercase nu, which looks like a little V straight on the left side, a little bit curved on the right side. That's a nu. All right, so essentially, a T curve for however many degrees of freedom is just a shorter, fatter, normal curve. So here's your normal curve is this light blue one. You'll notice it's the thinnest of the bunch, the tallest, which means it's also the thinnest. Um, if you have five degrees of freedom, well, let's see. Let's start with the two. You notice the two is the shortest one and it's got the fattest tails. Five is a little bit shorter. The tails are not quite as fat. The normal curve is even, um, I'm sorry, five is taller here. The tails are not as fat. The normal curve is the tallest of the bunch and its tails are the thinnest of the bunch. So the bottom line is there are an infinite number of T curves. The more and more data points you have, the bigger your sample size, the closer and closer your T-curve is to a Z-curve. So your T-curves are just kind of like um, sloppy normals, if you want to look at it that way. And the more data you have, the more and more normal that T-curve looks because you have more and more information. See, at least in the Z statistic, we knew that we knew the population sigma. Oh, you couldn't see that there. We knew the population sigma, that told us something about the population. So now we don't have that, so our curve's gonna be a little sloppier, but the bigger and bigger and bigger your sample size is, the closer and closer your T-curve is gonna get to normal. So again, I encourage you to read this um, section on page 310 about the T-distribution. And as you saw here in my book, Page A18 is where we put the T table. But before we get to the table, 
Let's talk about degrees of freedom. What is that? That's something new for us. And I said it is the number of data points minus one. And let's take a look at what that means. Here I have three data points. I have three, four, and some unknown data point. If I tell you that the mean is four, there can only be one number that goes here, and what is it? Clearly, it would be five. So I have two data points that can change. The moment these two data points are fixed, this third data point is also fixed. Once, if I say this is three and this is five and the mean is four, well, once I fix three and five, this has to be four, can't be anything else. So these two numbers decide what this third number is. So that's why there are two degrees of freedom here. Once these two are fixed and we know the mean, this one is also fixed. Now, later on, we'll, we'll see some examples where degrees of freedom is not n minus one. We're not gonna worry about that right now. So let's turn to page A18 and learn how to read the T table. Nice thing about the T table is that there's only uh, one page. All right. First thing, let's look at the pictures and see what it's telling us. Nice thing about this T table is it's giving us all sorts of information. Do we want a confidence level C? Are we interested in a tail size? You know, one tail, so, you know, that upper tail of 5%, what value cuts that off? Or are we interested in two tails? Um, if I want the middle 80%, though each tail has to be 10%, so that would be a 20% in the two tails. This is this information up here. If we're doing a confidence interval, we want to go from a negative T to a positive T, and we're gonna use these numbers up here. These are our confidence levels. Using this table, we can only make confidence intervals of 80, 90, 95, 98, and 99% confidence. If I wanna know something about the left tail, the left tail alpha, you know, so alpha might be 5%, the only tail sizes that I can consider are 10, five, two and a half, one, or a half a percent. Now you see if I wanted two tails, get ha a half an alpha each. So if the two tails together have to be um, something, the only alpha I could use for the two tails are twice the one tail. So in the, um, normal curve table, the Z score is, you know, along the top and down the side, and the table value is the area under the curve. It's reversed on the T table. On the T table, I give you the um, area under the curve up here, and all these values down here are your, what we call T critical. They are the T-scores that mark off these areas under the curve. So for instance, let's say I wanted to do a 95% confidence interval and I had a sample size of 10 from which I drew my mean. So what I would do is I would do N minus one or nine degrees of freedom. As I said, I wanted a 95% confidence interval. So my T critical value would be 2.262. And what we'll see in a moment is on confidence intervals, that margin of error instead of Z critical times sigma over root N, that margin of error now gonna be T critical times S over root N. So here's my T critical value. You'll notice that you know, for a 95% confidence interval, if you've only got two data points, one degree of freedom, you're gonna have a very, very large confidence interval. And these 
these T critical values get smaller, 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 smaller. Let's keep going down this middle column here. Boom, to infinity. You have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. You should recognize this number 1.960 as a Z critical value. Um, for 95%, remember we said it was you know two standard deeds. Well, that was a rule of thumb. It's really 1.96. So bottom line is what I said earlier, the more and more data points you get, the closer and closer your T curve comes to a Z curve. So you have an infinite number of data points, which means you have perfect information. You do, these are normal curve values. So the, this, you don't even need a normal curve now you know, if we're using the standard values up here because you have the Z critical values right down here at the bottom. So why is T critical always, always, always greater than Z critical for any um, confidence level C? Well, it's because if you know sigma, you know more about your population. So you can be 95% confident that this little interval here contains the true mu. If you don't even know sigma, you know less about the population. So you're going to need a bigger interval to be sure that it contains mu or to be sure that 95% chance that this interval contains mu. So let's create a confidence interval when we don't know sigma. Well, I've already given you the formula because I'm a wonderful person. So we turn to page 312 of our current textbook. And you see the guideline. Now they give you the formula for S, but you don't need to do this formula you know, these formulas for your mean and standard deep, especially if you have a calculator like this, you can put the uh, data in to the stat function and the it'll come up with the mean and the standard deep, both sample and population for you. Obviously, our, we're going to use sample data, so we would want to pull S out of here. If you do not have a calculator like this that will do that, um, Remind me in class and we can talk about how StatCrunch will do that. So here are our two formulas. If you know sigma, here's the formula you use. And again, it's Z critical times sigma over root N is your margin of error. If you don't know sigma, it's T critical times S over root N. If you know the sigma and the Z always going to go together. The T and the S are always going to go together. You'll never have a Z critical times S over root N. In fact, if you remind me, there's a story about the guy who invented the T curve was doing that, was getting an error. And then he realized there was a mistake. And so he created the T curve. So what do we do if our actual degrees of freedom is not on the table? For instance, go ahead and look at your table on page A18. And we notice that, let's say we have a sample size of 50, which means our degrees of freedom is 49. And 49 degrees of freedom is not on the table. What do we do? You see down here at the bottom, we start getting skipping numbers. We go 40, 45, and 50. So clearly, we have to round. What do we round to? In this case, remember I told you sometimes we always round up, like in our last lesson where we rounded up on that sample size. This is a case where we always round down. So 49 degrees of freedom, to play it safe, I would have to round down to 45 because if I went to 50 degrees of freedom, I would be saying that I have more precision more, I have more information about the population than I actually have. And my confidence interval would not be correct. 95% of my confidence intervals might not contain the true mu. So by rounding down to 45, at least 90, if I'm doing a 95% confidence interval, 
um, at least 95% of my intervals would contain the population mu. So when we're doing degrees of freedom, we always round down if, the, if our um, degrees of freedom is not on the table. I mentioned this earlier, and that just says is the last line on the T table is actually just normal curve values. If you look at page 311, the try it yourself problem, here's part D. So the try it yourself problem says, um, find the T critical value for a 95 or 90% 90 confidence interval when the sample size is 22. So a sample size of 22 means we have 21 degrees of freedom. So I draw a shorter, fatter normal curve. That's my T curve. And I want the middle 90%. And what are my T critical values? So it says identify the degrees of freedom. I've done that. Identify the confidence level. Well, they told us it was 90%. Find the T critical values. So if we go to page A18, I go to the row for 21 degrees of freedom, 90% confidence interval. So here's 90% confidence interval, 21 degrees of freedom, 1.721. You'll notice, by the way, all these numbers are positive. T curve is symmetrical, just like the normal curve is, symmetrical about its mean. So the negative numbers work as well. So this is positive 1.721 and negative 1.721. And when it says interpret the results, so this is my this is my graph. You could see that uh, if I have samples of size 22, then um, you know the margin of error would be t critical times s over root n. This is, these are the two T critical values I would use to ensure that I got 90% of the data. That didn't come out right. Those would be the T critical values that I would use to ensure that I got a 90% confidence interval for my data. All right. That's all I have for you on this lesson. We'll work some sample problems in class. Have a great day.